Hi, welcome to the Autoversity Podcast, the number one podcast for car sales and other sales professionals who want to become unstoppable in their sales and business career. This podcast is hosted by Dwayne Marino and Camden McInnes. Now sit back, buckle up, and enjoy the show. All right, Dwayne, how are you? Good, Camden. How's your weekend going? Yeah, it's going great. How about you? Going really well. Just uh, been spending most of all, like most of my time, just inside working. I haven't really gone out since Christmas. Just trying to stay focused. Well, it's uh, that's pretty focused. It's almost March. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you got to get outside. Yeah. Their brother get some vitamin D. I don't know what you're doing, but anyways. Yeah, I definitely do. Um, I have some questions here from Instagram, and I'm hoping that you can uh, just uh, take a few minutes to go over them with me. Sure. Awesome. So the first question is, going forward into 2018, what trends do you predict for the automotive industry that salespeople should be aware of? Okay. All right. Well, a couple of ways to answer that. First off, uh, let's talk about industry. So if you watch the uh, the news, um, you'd, you'd never know this. The automotive sector, Canada and the States, has been on fire for a number of years. Almost month after month up here, we've been breaking record after record after record. So uh, the automotive space has never been better. Not that market always decides how successful you are, but if somebody's looking for a, you know an excuse or a good reason to do well, uh, the market's fantastic. Um, in general terms, the stock market's up enormously. Crane indexes in all the major cities are at all-time highs. Construction starts, all-time highs. Unemployment for many sectors, all-time lows. Personal debt is dropping. Uh, it's the first time in my memory, in my lifetime, that we're not dropping bombs anywhere on the planet on anybody. So anyways, overall, things are great. So I'm anticipating another awesome year. Last year was good, so that that should go well. Um, from there, you know, if a salesperson wants to be successful, it's all about doing the right things, uh, taking massive action, right? And having the right, uh, the right tool set in front of you, but actually executing it. So organization, uh, studying what actually works, making yourself better, improving yourself every day and, uh, really, you know, chasing down your business the best you can during your money hours is, is always been the way to go. So I, I foresee great things for the coming year. I'm very optimistic. And on that note. Um, all the major manufacturers, too, that have been out of leasing for the last few years, since 2008, 2010, because leasing uh, to a car manufacturer, they're on the hook when that car comes back, and they tend to pull back their horns on leasing if they predict that either residual values and or market is not going to be in a great you know, great place when those leases come off, and those usually go together. They've been out of leasing for a number of years. They're all coming back into it in a very large way. So whatever crystal balls they're using, I can tell you from being on that side of the fence for a number of years, uh, their crystal ball is saying things are going to be good here for a while. So I think it's all awesome news for everybody. So right now is the best time in a very long time um, to get into the automotive sales industry. Uh, it's a great time. It's absolutely a great time. When I was in my early 20s, I had to go repossess cars because there's nothing going on in any other part of the business. My first mortgage was 14 and three quarter percent. I mean, people really don't know, uh, oh, yeah. you know, what, yeah, what, four, you know, what 14 and three quarter percent mortgages are like to have on your back and, and what recessions or depressions really look like. Right now, money's free everywhere. It's almost 0% across the board. Even mortgage rates are, are less than 3% or 4%. So anyways, there's no excuses. Everybody likes to make excuses. It's ridiculous uh, when I see negative, miserable people now, but it is what it is. So yeah, great time to be in the business and be pretty much in any business for that matter. Awesome. I, I also heard that some of the uh, factories, um, the automotive factories are going to be reopening back up oh, in yeah. uh, Motor City there? Uh, absolutely. Is that accurate? Yes, it sure is. Yeah, a lot of manufacturing jobs um, are coming back. Plants are opening up. Um, Apple's now coming back to the U.S. That's, uh, yeah, huge industry returning 
Um, anyways, it's great. It's awesome. Amazing. Okay, and uh, watching the news, you'd never ever think that no. that would be the case. <laughs> no, you sure wouldn't. No. Okay, so I have um, next question is: What advice do you have for sales managers who want to rebuild their sales team from the ground up? Okay, so there's two parts to that question. I think um, from the ground up. So if it's from the ground up because it's a new dealership or a new point, congratulations. Growth and expansion is always awesome. So that's that's a different situation than from the ground up because your people are quitting or fi you know being fired. Anytime somebody quits or is fired, really management needs to look at themselves, look in the mirror because that's that's never a good sign um, or a good indication sometimes on how they how they recruit or hire or you know train or coach or even you know counsel to terminate. So if it's, uh, you know, constant attrition of people leaving, maybe there's some things that, uh, you know, it's going on in the business that needs to be readdressed. When management finally decides to rebuild that team or try to do a good job of it, then make sure that they're studying, as I say, what works. There's nothing worse than doing the wrong things and studying the wrong things because you're actually reinforcing bad habits and, and moving in the wrong direction. And a lot of sales managers, and again, I'm just talking in general terms, don't invest in themselves. They come off of you know whatever position they were in before that, some from the sales floor, some from outside industries. They get the management title, and they seem to think it's uh, you know it's game over for learning at that point. So I still take training courses myself once or twice. Um, I go all over the place, listen to great speakers and people that I follow. I'm on YouTube all the time. I read books. So I'm saying, you know, sales managers need to invest in themselves, and then they can turn around and invest in their people. If I came to you, Camden, and I said, give me a, give me a, you know, I don't know, give me a wrench. And, you know, there's an assumption there is that you have a wrench. You can't give me something you don't have. So when your people look at a manager and they want to get, you know, great attitude, good work habits, good processes, um, that type of stuff. If the manager doesn't have it, they can't give it. So leadership means you go first, you go before your people and that you're able to do what you're teaching your people to do. It really actually blows my mind um, that a lot of people don't do things like reading and the train and take more courses at yeah. this certain stage in history. Because with, with the technology, things are changing faster than it's ever been. It's actually almost really hard to keep up with and, and kind of uh, scary because things are just happening so fast. And <laughs> Pretty soon the cars are going to be driving themselves and they'll, they'll always need salespeople um, who will yes, there's, need to. That's right. No, there's no lack of information. Yes. There's almost too much of it out there, but there's definitely a lack of execution. And success or failure is always a result of either information or execution. So pay attention to those two things. Awesome. So this actually goes into my next question. And um, as a sales manager, I would assume that a sales manager kind of needs to take on of more of a mentorship role. Can you explain the importance of mentorships in sales and business and whether or not you would have been as successful as you are now without meeting mentors like Joe Girard along your journey? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's funny you mentioned Joe Girard because I just read today that it looks like his record is beaten. Somebody has uh, beaten him. He's, they've contacted the Guinness Book of World Records, another salesperson in Michigan. He's contesting oh, it. Crap. Yeah, I know. Uh, you know. Joe holds multiple records in many different areas of automotive sales. So this guy apparently had a, a year that beat him by about 100 cars, but we'll see if that's valid. If it is valid, Congratulations to him. Whatever he's doing, he's doing a super awesome, uh, awesome job. So I think that that's that's really great. Um, examples like that, you know, I've not met him. I know Joe well. I, I will make a point to meet him in the near future if this record turns out to be true. But, uh, you know, our peer groups, either our imagined peer groups or our real peer groups, uh, define us in a lot of ways. They set up our belief systems. They set up our values. And from there, we can, you know, adopt uh, attitudes and behaviors. So I think mentorship and having a peer group that you you know want to be part of, even an imaginary one or one that you meet through, uh, you know, reading books or you know watching stuff on on the internet is extremely important. If you're lucky enough to have a personal mentorship with somebody that actually wants to make you better, not pee on your brains, doesn't get jealous. I mean, then you're one in very very few. But a lot of people just have to create peer groups that um, aren't directly associated with him for a lot of reasons. But I think having that blueprint of uh, an actual human being that's doing something better than you that you aspire to become is extremely important. So yeah, mentors in, in many areas of your life, uh, I think are, are the key and those mentors naturally will change. And you're always modeling key traits of the, that person, not the whole person. So you're not trying to find anybody perfect. You're just trying to find somebody that does some things that you you know aspire to become and you're modeling uh, those key areas of your life to become more like them. 
Okay, yeah, it's it's actually funny. One of uh, a book that I'm currently reading called Thinking Grow Rich. Um, one of the advices is um, to have like a. Sorry, I'm looking at it right now on my shelf, Camden. Like literally, I'm looking at that book right now on my shelf. <laughs> That's crazy. That's actually crazy. Yeah. Sorry, what was it? What did the book say, Camden? I cut you off. What, what Sorry, um, no, there was a, a certain uh, part in the book where where he talks about. Um, I. I guess it's more like a meditation exercise where you sit, where you imagine yourself sitting at a table with like a bunch of people through history as like your counsel and you kind of take advice from them. So for like someone like me, it'd be like someone like Bruce Lee or Socrates and all those other guys that I have read about and I imagine what they would say to me. That's, that's exactly, yeah, the, uh, the imaginary mastermind group with the key people that you look up to. And you know what? I, I, I mean, we could talk about that for a while, but yes, I think that's uh, that's a brilliant idea. Awesome. Well, this next question actually kind of goes into that. Um, in a, your book, Unstoppable Selling, you talk about successful people either being the example or the lesson. Can you give me an example of some of the things you've seen successful automotive salespeople do for those who, you know, especially if they're first getting involved in this art of, of uh, sales, um, there are a lot of things that people would be struggling with. What are some of the key things that you see some of the really successful people like yourself and Joe Gerard doing that makes them more successful than others? Okay, so look around the business that you're in, um, any sales organization that you're in, and there's there's what I talk about is kind of you know five or six different types of salespeople. It'll give you two extremes. Um, you've got one salesperson that that has some okay skills doesn't make really great money but makes a living but generally changes organizations every two to four years that person over a period of years will develop a pretty negative attitude and a bit of burnout because they never are staying in one place long enough to develop any kind of consistent relationships that are going to get them the repeats and referrals that make business fun and stress-free and a lot easier and the other salesperson to watch within your business that did the exact opposite thing is they may have had more or less skills, uh, but they stayed put. And really, once you find a company that you like with the product you believe in, your job is to retire there because at the end of the day, relationships are the thing that makes business, any business, easier and easier and easier. So do what you can to not lie and, and do all the other stuff right. Be enjoyable, memorable, and valuable to your customers and for them after you sell that product. But uh, look around your showroom, look at the people that have the relationships, and look at the people that don't. And you'll see two very different uh, incomes and lifestyles. Uh, it's incredible. Like it's it's extreme differences there. So I would look at that and decide which part of the you know which part of the process or or business do you want to join. It's actually really interesting because I I even uh, see this in a lot of the huge entrepreneur space and in the whole internet world, where you'll see a lot of people um, dabbling. They'll they'll start this business and you know if. If they stick to it long enough, they may make a few dollars, or like they'll come out with this next bright, they'll come out with this next big bright idea, and then and then they'll just drop that other thing they were doing that they may have been successful at had they stuck to it, and they just keep chasing new ideas and they never go anywhere. And you exactly. see them a year, like you see them a year from now when you talk to them and they're doing this, and then and and then you ask them what happened to that other idea? Oh, it didn't work out, or whatever but the common thing is they just never stuck with it long enough they never built those relationships um it's so i've i've, I've noticed that a lot there's a real lack of commitment when it comes to wanting to be successful everybody's looking for the uh you know the get rich quick scheme and one advice if you know you're one of those people out there that are listening that tend to do that and i know a few that do that myself at least keep it to yourself do all these startups and be very private about it so you don't also have the embarrassment of everybody looking at you going why are you such a flake? Why are you bouncing around so much? Why do you never commit? Why do you never succeed? So if you want to try some things, try it privately and then make your, you know, make it known publicly once you decide what you want to settle down to. And, and, you know, once you get some success, but people that publicly keep trying new stuff and new things and new things, and it's, 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 I'm embarrassed for them. It's, it's not, it's not helping your reputation in any way, shape or form. Yeah, no, not at all. In a, in a, one of your videos, uh, you're talking about, um, I guess it was kind of like a joke story about Ang uh, Agnes McPherson. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for, for those of you who are listening, just uh, you can um, check it out on the YouTube channel. I'll, I'll uh, 
leave a link to it in the video below. But basically, it's about how, you know, no matter what you do, your reputation will follow you and how you should probably be very careful about the type of decisions you make. So. That's a good, good analysis and a good way to summarize it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, is uh, there anything else that, that you would like to touch on before we uh, wrap things up? Uh, Sunday afternoon. And I hope everybody had a great weekend. You just have, you know, create a great week. We do create our weeks. Great weeks start by committing yourself to have a good day. And then, you know, good days turn into good weeks. Good weeks turn into good months. Good months turn into good years and good years turn into good lives. But it starts with making a commitment first thing in the morning, every day and through the day, that today's going to be a great day. So go create one, Camden, and create a great week, buddy. I will. Everyone who's listening, make sure you, you subscribe to the channel and uh, check out Dwayne's event calendar. I'll post it in the description below. Thank you so much, Dwayne, for speaking with me. Thanks, Camden. Take care, buddy. You too. Bye. How many sales a month do you or your sales team miss because of ineffective skills, stale habits, or bad attitudes? What if you had a secret way to make up just half of those lost sales per month every month? Marino TV is your secret. It's the number one online sales training program in the automotive industry, dedicated to building attitudes and skills that result in unstoppable results. Our virtual distance learning is designed specifically to help sales managers, sales professionals, F&I managers, and service advisors increase their production as Marino TV offers over 3,000 video sales training chapters for all levels of skill. Let Marino TV show you step-by-step -step how to deal with today's educated and transaction-ready buyer in person, on the phone, over live video, or by email. If you're ready to have your sales soar and your stress drop, call 1-888-735-6275 or visit DwayneMarino.com or buy our books, Unstoppable Attitude, Unstoppable Selling, and Unstoppable Money on Amazon now.